How's it going ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Donnie here again. This time we're going to take a look at heating curves. So our objectives will be to interpret heating cooling curves uh, and calculate the energy changes associated with them. So heating curves, what are they all about? Heating curves show how the temperature of a substance changes as heat is added to it. Uh, if we removed heat instead, we would have something that looked like the mirror image and we would call it a cooling curve, right? Because it would be cooling it. It would kind of look like the mirror image. You'd start high and end low in that case because it's a cooling curve. But the same thing applies. So let's start with a cold substance in the solid phase and start adding some heat. So solid phase, I'm going to be low temperature. I haven't added any joules of heat yet. So I'm starting right there. Uh, what's it look like? Here's a solid Definite shape, definite volume, start adding some heat, and what happens to the particles? They start jiggling around more, start wiggling more. They have more kinetic energy as the energy gets absorbed. Uh, the temperature rises and the solid particles start vibrating in place more rapidly. So what's that look like on the graph? Well, temperature goes up, we only have the solid phase, and that's going to continue heating until we get to the melting point. So once we've reached the melting point, any added energy will go into overcoming the attractions between the molecules and not increasing the temperature. So the temperature is going to stay flat. We add more heat. What's happening? It's turning all these solid particles into a liquid state, and that's where all the energy is going. So what's that going to look like on a graph? Well, it's going to be a flat section because the temperature stays the same until all of it's melted. So during this part of the heating curve, we have both the solid and the liquid state present. So after all the substance has been melted and everything's in the liquid phase, energy added to it will now increase the temperature slash kinetic energy, right? Because temperature is a measure of kinetic energy. So we keep adding more heat and they'll start moving around more. So they'll start, they'll increase their kinetic energy. So things start moving faster and the temperature will go up. Now, just like in the solid state, it will go up until it reaches the phase change point. For this, it'll be the uh, boiling point. So once you reach the boiling point, the temperature will stay the same again until all of the molecules make it into the gas phase, right? So you've got to keep adding heat, adding heat, vaporizing that those liquid particles into the gas state. Temperature is going to stay the same. We're going to have two phases present. We're going to have the liquid and the gas phase present until all of it vaporizes. So temperature flat. Uh, the added energy is going into breaking the attraction between the molecules and spreading them out, right? Liquid state, those particles are real close together. Attraction is relatively strong. Gas phase spread apart. Attractive force is really weak. Um, so once all the particles are in the gas phase, when we add more uh, energy to it, the kinetic energy will increase and the gas particles start moving around quicker. Temperature will go up. So yeah. Things to notice. So section BC is shorter than section DE. So uh, BC is where we have the melting and DE is where we have the vaporization. So the reason for that is melting requires a lot less energy than boiling does. Um, so if you take a look at like the heat of fusion of water, it's like 334 joules per gram for melting, but for vaporization, it's like 2,260 joules per gram. So it takes a lot more energy to vaporize something than it does to melt something. Another thing to pay attention to is section EF is steeper than CD. So you can see, hey, why is that? Well, it takes less energy to heat up a gas than it does a liquid, right? So you add the same amount of energy to a gas, you're gonna get a bigger temperature change than you would if it was liquid water. All right, so energy changes. When we only have one phase present, you gotta use the Q equals MC delta T, where Q is the joules, M is the mass, C is your specific heat, and your delta T is your change in temperature. So sections AB, CD, and EF, you're gonna to wanna to use this equation. When it's going through a phase change, you gotta use the Q equals MH, either fusion or vaporization, and you gotta make sure that your units agree. So. Sometimes they might give you joules per gram for heat of fusion. Um, sometimes they'll give you moles or kilojoules per mole. Uh, so section BC and DE, where it's flat, you're gonna use that one of those versions. So for BC, where you have melting, you gotta use the heat of fusion. For DE, you gotta use the heat of vaporization. 
things to watch for. Uh, sometimes the specific heat, little c, uh, might be given to you in joules per gram degree Celsius, but the heat of fusion and vaporization, they might give you in kilojoules per mole. So when you're asked to calculate the energy of all that changes, you gotta make sure that your units are gonna agree with each other. So example problem, how much energy would it take to heat four grams of ice at negative 10 Celsius into steam at 100 degrees Celsius? The specific heat of ice and water are 2.1 joules per gram degree Celsius and 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius respectively. And the heat of fusion and vaporization of water is 6.01 kilojoules per mole and 40.7 kilojoules per mole respectively. So you see these units don't agree. So when we do the math, all right, well, we're going to want to look at the section where it's just the solid being heated. You got to do a different math for when there's solid and liquid present when it's melting. You got to do different math when it's just liquid, and then you got to do different math when it's liquid and gas. And you can see the problem saying just converting it into steam at the boiling point. So once it's a gas, we're done. All right, so if it's just the solid, we got to use the Q equals MC delta T. And the mass, they tell us, is 4.0 zero grams our specific heat of ice they tell me is 2.1 joules per gram degrees celsius and my delta t my change in temperature well i was at negative 10 degrees celsius so now i got to get it to zero degrees celsius for water so the change in temperature is 10 degrees celsius when i do that math i get 84 joules all right so when we are melting now we've reached the melting point we got to change our math the heat needed for that is going to be equal to uh m h fusion now i'm going to start with the the heat of fusion they tell me it's 6.01 kilojoules per mole so i can't times it by grams because it's per mole so i got to convert to grams well i know that uh moles is grams per the gram formula mass so for this, I would get 4.00 grams divided by 18.02 grams per mole. That's gonna leave with moles. When I do this math, I get uh, 1.33 kilojoules. Now note, this one was in joules, this was in kilojoules, so I'm gonna have to address that later. All right, so now that all of it's melted and it's all just liquid, now I can go back to my Q equals MC delta T. So my mass is 4.00 grams. My C for liquid water is that 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius. And my delta T, well, I'm at my freezing point, my melting point is zero Celsius, and I gotta get to the boiling point at 100, so my change in temperature is 100.0 degrees Celsius. When I do that math, I end up with 1,672 joules. Again, I'm gonna to have to address that. And then liquid to gas, once I'm at the boiling point, uh, I'm gonna go back to the Q equals the, the heat of vaporization times, in this case, it's gonna be moles, right? So I go, all right, well, my heat of vaporization is 40.7 kilojoules per mole times, well, how many moles do I have? Well, it's gonna be that 4.00 grams divided by 18.02 grams per mole for H2O. And then when I do that math, I end up with 9.03 kilojoules. All right, so I got kilojoules, I got joules, I gotta fix this, I gotta turn one to the other. I'm gonna end up with, uh, I'm gonna go for kilojoules. I want things in kilojoules. So 84 joules divided by 1,000 gives me 0 0.084 kilojoules. 1.33 kilojoules is fine because it's kilojoules. All right, 1672 joules divided by 1,000, I end up with 1,000, I'm sorry, 1 1.672 kilojoules. And my last one is already in kilojoules. So now I've got everything in kilojoules, I add them all together and I get 12.116 uh, kilojoules roughly, not accounted for sick pigs, so yeah. Summarize, can you interpret heating and cooling curves and calculate the energy associated with the phase changes and stuff? I hope so. I hope you found it helpful. I'll see you in class. Goodbye.